Got it. Jackie, you're the best. Awesome. Oh, Welcome back to another night of Empowerment Week. I'm so glad that we have so many people back again for night three. I appreciate all of you guys coming back. We're learning about accessible spaces today. Before we get started, I do want to give a shout out to our uh, sponsor, Kenda Tires. So if you are a manual wheelchair user, go ahead and drop your name in the chat and you'll be entered in for a tire giveaway at the end of the event. I think Julie won last time, didn't she? I won last last round. So did Chris. Last, last, yeah, last in yeah. winter. So great. So without further ado, we have the lovely Julie Sawchuk here to talk about accessible spaces. She is amazing. She has written books on this. She's read on her own farmhouse. So she has a lot of knowledge to share with us tonight. So without further ado, go ahead and take it over, Julie. Thank you, everybody. So you can see in the background here, this is um, it's, it's, it's my version of my old farmhouse. And after my injury, this is the farmhouse that I came home to. Um, it is no longer standing. We tore it down and I built a new house. And that is what we are going to see tonight. I'm going to show you my new accessible home that I designed um, and I'm not an architect. It is possible to make accessible spaces and not be an architect. Um, of course, we worked with an architect, but it took us about two and a half years to figure out, um, just have to let some people in here, to figure out how to design the space that was going to work for me and for my family. I have a husband, I have two teenage kids now, and we wanted it to work for everybody. That whole universal design principle was something that we were really aiming for, um, but we didn't know anything like we didn't know anything about accessibility because when you're injured with a spinal cord injury that's you know boom life changes on a dime and there's not a lot of books and resources out there and if you hang into the end of the meeting tonight um i have a copy of my book for you so i have a i have that gift for everybody and i'm i'm very excited to be able to share that with you so we're going to start I'm going to take everywhere in my house and I, oh gosh. Okay. Sorry. I, I got to stop here for a second because I was, I was saying to um, Brie and Jackie before I started that uh, I can tell how excited I am and that this is my most, the most passionate thing that I do in all of my work because I got butterflies in my stomach about 10 minutes ago. And like, I don't get butterflies anymore. I did, um, I did an International Women's Day event for KPMG, which is a really big accounting firm um, just last month. And I spoke to 800 people and I did not get butterflies. And so to get butterflies, inviting all of you people into my house tonight, um, it, it just proves to me that this is what I, am, what I am meant to do. So thank you for being here. Um, <laughs> thanks, Lori. I'm trying to let people in at the same time and not get too incredibly distracted. Um, admit. There we go. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna I'm gonna roll you. First of all, we're in the we're in the front foyer of my house. I'm gonna roll out um, out my front door. I live in the country and I have kind of sketchy internet. So if at any point I um, I freeze, I will come I will come back. So stay with me. So we're going to go out the front door um, because one of the first things that people think when when you have an accessible home that you can't have uh, a front door that is accessible. See that T pull door closer? I love it. I just put it on. Anyways, I don't have steps. I have a beautiful front patio. Here's my house. As you can tell, you're tra traveling on my lap. So this is what my house looks like from the outside. I have no front steps and people are like, well, how can you have a front patio if you don't have front steps? <laughs> no, I think I have a pretty beautiful front patio. So fool to all of you who think you can have a beautiful front patio if you don't have front steps. You don't need to throw a ramp on the front of a house. It's a brand new build to make accessible. You build it level with the ground 
so right. that it's ready to roll just for you. Um, we did any stone that's really um, smooth and level, because as you know, as a wheelchair user, the more bumps you have, the harder it is on your body, the more likely you are to have nerve pain or spasticity, right? So you want to have super smooth surfaces. And let's go back and back. I didn't think the, I didn't, I wish I had chosen different um, door sills. I'm going to show you my door sills. So this is the thing about um, building a space is there's always things that you would do differently, right? And I am more than happy to share with people the, the lessons um, as well as the wins. So, I mean, it's certainly a win. I don't have steps, but there is, there is, there's enough of a bump there that I have to think about it. It's not something that I worry about. It doesn't cause me any difficulty, but I do have to think about it. And um, Anne is here in the waiting room, letting people in. Okay, and then, um, okay, sorry, I got off track here. Coming into the house, level, open, right. Lots of windows, lots of windows because in the old farmhouse, we didn't have lots of windows. So we didn't get enough daylight in our brains and you know, that affects you, your mental health as well, right? So um, because we live in the country, we don't have to worry about neighbors seeing it and all of that. Plus I can see the UPS guy dropping off all of our packages in the past two years, right? <laughs> oh, here comes the UPS truck. Two more people coming in. So when you come into my house, you come right into, I'm gonna flip around. So I'm still here connected to you, but I'm gonna have you traveling on my lap. So you come into my house, is that a good angle, Bree? Yes, ma'am. Okay, perfect. Come into my house and you come into the kitchen dining room area. And as you can see, lots of windows. So we're gonna start in the kitchen. We have an island in the middle of the kitchen with uh, like a, it's kind of a galley style, right? Where we have an aisle between two sides of counters. And as I roll through the kitchen, you're gonna see that there are actually four different heights of counters. So the island on my right is the tall island for my tall people. My husband is 6'3". And then the, the sink counter on the left is a regular height, which is 36 inches. And then that drops down to the um, cooktop counter height, which is 32 inches. I'll talk about the cooktop, cooktop in a minute. And then this is my favorite spot right here. This is my island, my part of the island. And this is where I work um, on the butcher block here. This is my prep spot. This is my office when my desk gets messy. This is the breakfast bar. This is the homework station, right? This is where the magic happened in the kitchen. We just ate dinner here actually, instead of going all the way to the kitchen table. Yeah, way all the way over there. So, uh, I learned a lot just with this itself, this, this, uh, piece of maple here came when, when it got delivered. Um, I realized that I hadn't given specific enough instructions to the kitchen people because I rolled up to it and I was like, Oh, it's so beautiful. And right here, I was like, Oh, that's not the way I want it to be because this edge was perfectly square and mm -hmm. hard on my forearms. Mm -hmm. So I sent it back. <laughs> I, I said, okay, um, we need to round this off. So they actually took it back to the factory. They rounded the top edge and they rounded the corners. How many people here are on a day-to-day -day basis, either raise your hand or nod or put a yes in the chat, fear for their safety or their well-being on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay, the activities that you do at some point throughout your day, you think that's not safe or I am at risk, right? So every time you think like that, you are stressing yourself and 
um, when we put ourselves in stressful situations, that costs us energy. So when I, when I titled this presentation to um, save energy and reduce stress, by having your space as accessible as possible, that is what you are doing. You are saving your energy and you are reducing your stress because what it means is you'll be able to then do something else with that energy that you would have otherwise been wasting. So just like, you know, a sharp corner on a, on a, on a table or a, a counter edge isn't really a safety thing, but my friend Chris would tell you that she has bruised her forearms by leaning on a sharp desk for long periods of time, right? <laughs> there, she's showing her arms. <laughs> <laughs> so those kinds of things, these little tiny niggly things add up over the course of the day, throughout the week, throughout your life. So my goal is to eliminate as much of that as possible. Okay. So I'm there. Gonna, you could just mute your microphones if you're oh, not sorry. Right mute. That would be fabulous. Thanks very much. I've warmed up enough. I get to take my coat off now. So I'm going to show you a bunch of examples of things that are um, little energy saving things and some that are big energy saving things. And we're going to start here in the kitchen. So behind me here is my cooktop. And in my old farmhouse, we had a regular oven, um, which was, you know, whatever height a regular oven is, say like about here. And you can be cooking on that regular oven. And sure, you can stir inside the pot. But can you see inside the pot? Nope, everybody shaking their head. Can't see inside the pot. How do you know if the onions are caramelized or burnt? Right? You don't. You need to be able to see in the pot. It's not just a, are the onions caramelized perfectly safety thing, right? So now that I have a cooktop that is a roll under cooktop, I can see inside the pot and I know when things are cooked and I can deal with them in a safe manner. So the the biggest risk that we face in the kitchen is from burns, whether that's burns from a pot on the stove, um, a frying pan, something like that, or whether it's a burn from a sink and hot water. And I'm going to show you another example of uh, a learning, a learning teachable moment from my, from my life in this house. I didn't actually burn myself in the old house. I burned myself in this house. So that was a tragic learning experience. So this is what happened. Um, so in this same part of the kitchen here, I've got the cooktop over there and I've got a prep sink here. So this is my, this is the Julie sink. So what I can do is I can slide a pot from the cooktop across, cause this is a heat proof surface, pot of boiling water, potato water, whatever. I can slide it across and I can then dump it, dump the hot water, the pasta water into this sink. What happened was I burned my knees. So it's a roll under, I'm gonna put my um, computer down on the floor so I can show you this. So roll under, I can put my knees right under here. But the problem was when I ordered the plumbing fixtures and uh, was dealing with the plumber, I told him what I wanted, but he couldn't find exactly the measurements of what I wanted. So he found what he thought was gonna work what was the best and and he did the best that he could and i'm not blaming him at all um and then when when it got installed i was like oh my knees touch the bottom of the sink okay well i'll do something about that right like i'll, I'll fix that so my knees are right touching <laughs> you can't see very well anyways my knees are rubbing on the bottom of the sink i'm also wearing boots that's why this is happening so I did just that. I pulled a pot of potato water, slid it across the counter, poured the potato water in the sink, and my knees were on the bottom of that stainless steel sink. And I burned third degree on the top of my knee, but I didn't even know what was happening because I couldn't feel it, right? That heat transferred right through the sink to my knees. So, I, you know, I was fine. It was fine. It was a terrible situation, but I, I survived. So, you know, it's a hard way to learn a lesson. So I have since, um, I'm in a different chair than I was then, and I have 
my knees don't actually touch the bottom of the sink except for when I'm wearing boots, which happens to be right now. So um, it's, you know, on my list of things to do to replace the sink to a shallower sink. So burns in the kitchen, they totally, totally happen. So setting yourself up so that you can be safe, right? Um, another way to set yourself up to be safe is in the kitchen. I have my electrical outlets on the front facings of the counter. So I'm not having to reach across the surface to plug something in. I'm not having to reach across the stove to, to plug something in. I can plug my immersion soup blender in right here and use it right beside the stove. The, um, the thing that you have to watch out for when you have something plugged in here is that you're not catching your push handles on the cord as you whip around in the kitchen, which I know some of us tend to move faster than we ought to because we're in a hurry, right? We're always in a rush. You got to do it. You got to do it. And then you, you whip past something and you go crap. Or I've, I, I use a, uh, like a cutting board on my lap, right? And I'll have a, a glass bowl. Oh, a glass bowl. And I whip sideways and the bowl goes the other direction and smashes on the floor, right? Because it's a, it's a solid concrete floor. Let's talk about floors for a minute. Who here loves carpets? Put your hands up if you love carpets. Mm. Ah! <laughs> Marty, that was awesome. Marty took her hands off and crossed them across their chest like this. No, carpets are a terrible thing, right? I totally agree. That's why our house is no carpet except for one little area rug that I lost the battle about. Um, all slab on grade. Here's our um cement floor with one thin layer of vinyl plank the same throughout the entire house and choosing flooring is a challenging thing right because we're bringing our wheels in we're not you know taking our shoes off and wiping them on the carpet as we come into the house so we bring all of that dirt with us every time and so you want to have something that doesn't mark and the only way to really figure that out is to try it out. So when you're at a flooring store, you ask them to put the, the sample down on the floor, you roll over it, you go outside, you get your wheels dirty, you come back in and you roll over it again and you look at it from different angles and all of those kinds of things. Like um, we went to a bunch of different flooring stores and, and tried everything. And it's, it's tricky, especially if you have, um, you know, smaller people and you want to have a bit of a soft surface you have to have to kind of have to have a little bit of common ground and that's why we ended up with a little bit of carpet in um in the living room here so that was just a spot to have some people have warm feet <laughs> cats like it too of course um, so the other thing in the kitchen I wanted to talk about is the other place where you can have accidents and that's of course with the oven. So we installed a wall oven um, and installed it exactly at the height where the door opens with a side, so a side hinge and the door opens right over top of my knees. So I'm going to position myself so that the door opens right over top of my keyboard that's sitting on my lap. So that's not touching my knees at all. And what it means is I can reach right into the oven without leaning over top of the oven door. And obviously that's another safety thing, right? You're not, not wanting to lean over the door and you know, Hansel and Gretel fall into the oven. So from, from my perspective in, in teaching about accessibility, I look at accessibility with as like a three-legged milking stool. So you have safety, and we've talked a lot about safety. You have independence, right? Being able to function in your kitchen. And you have dignity. And those three things together, when they are combined in equal amounts, you have a stool that has a flat surface that you can sit on, right? That's your milking stool. If one of those legs is shorter, your milking stool is now on an angle and you can't sit 
right? You're cockeyed and you're like, oh, trying to keep your balance. You can't have a balanced life if you don't have independence, safety, and dignity as much as possible. And when you can sit on that flat milking stool, you get this protection, right, of energy. Energy that was being wasted that now you can play with your kids. Um, you can do your crafts. You can cook. You can work out. Oh, imagine having energy to work out whenever, right? To work, period. So being, being able to, okay, I got to backtrack. I was injured when I was 41. And at that stage of my life, I had two kids, a full-time job, a 10 acre farm, a market garden, and I was training for a triathlon. So I was doing anything I wanted, whenever I wanted, wherever I wanted. And then uh, sustained my injury, couldn't do anything, couldn't go anywhere, couldn't do anything that I wanted. And um, it, it, it just about killed me, like literally, figuratively, all of that. Coming back to my farmhouse, I couldn't be independent. And I couldn't cook. I had to have help in the kitchen all of the time, anytime I wanted to do anything. And it was this tiny little like picture of tiny farm kitchen, not like a generous farm kitchen. So the dishwasher was open. I was trapped in the kitchen or out of the kitchen. So we created spaces so that everybody could be in the kitchen together. So we could have community in our kitchen. And by community, it could be friends, you know, company, or it's just the four of us, but we can still all function in that space together. Um, but being able to be on my own in the kitchen and do everything that I wanna do, the only thing I really can't do is heavy pots right? Either heavy pot on and off the stove or a heavy pot in and out of the, in and out of the oven. You probably noticed this microwave. I should address this. This is like the elephant in the room. Everybody's looking at it like, why does she have a microwave way up high? Mandy, you saw that, didn't you? Right? So we actually have two microwaves. I know it's totally excessive. And we actually had like a marital row about having two microwaves. So this is my microwave. It's below the counter in the island so it's exactly at my height when we planned the kitchen my husband wanted to have a space for the microwave and I'm like we are not having two microwaves that's just ridiculous oh I'm not the only one with two microwaves yay Monique awesome <laughs> so working independently in the kitchen and being able to do all of my baking and all of my like uh one of, one of my things that makes me feel awesome is preparing good food for my people. So being able to do that independently again has really brought a lot of joy back to my life. All right, so kitchen. Oh, I have to show you my pantry. Sorry, this is like it's my party pantry. It's again, excessively large. We, we went from a really tiny farmhouse and we knew we didn't want to be in this tiny little space anymore. So we, we kind of built it a little bigger than we needed to. Also, with the forethought of likely the fact that we're going to be a multi-generational home, either Theo's parents or my parents will be coming to live with us. So you kind of have to think to the future. And that's the other thing about building for accessibility or renovating for accessibility. You have to think to the future what are you physically going to be capable of down the road or not be capable of? What kind of help are you going to need in the future? And do you need the space for that? What do you need from an electricity perspective? What do you need from a load bearing perspective? So all of those kinds of things are things that we considered space being one of them. So, but the bonus of having a pantry is you don't need to have uppers for storage. So if you can have a pantry for all of the things that would otherwise be in uppers, then you don't have to worry about how you're going to get the stuff from the uppers, right? You can do pull down cabinets and those kinds of things, but we wanted to have the space for windows. So we used the space for windows instead. The, um, the way I designed the pantry was so that the shelves were not deep. 
because there's nothing worse than not being able to find something, right? So instead of having like three rows deep of jars or, you know, baking ingredients or whatever, it's basically like one and a half rows deep. So I can see everything and I know where it is. The up high stuff is the stuff that I don't eat. I don't eat crackers. I don't eat cereal. Um, the candy is way up there. So it's out of reach. And the other funny thing, and I'm not really sure how this happened, but if I back up here, you can see it. That's the wine and the booze how that happened on the top shelf <laughs> i don't really know anyways i have to ask to drink a glass of wine how terrible is that <laughs> it doesn't really bother me that much so there is sort of the the low down on the kitchen some of the things that i would do differently i would have a little bit of a lower um uh counter height for the dishwashing sink I tell you, it's not my favorite activity. Um, so I'm not really concerned because I don't do most of the dishwashing. That's why I have children. Um, so I would make that a little bit lower next time because there's nothing worse than like hot, soapy, runny water dripping down and off your elbows, right? Not a fabulous feeling. So that's the second most important room in the house. Does anybody have any questions about kitchens before we move on to the first most important room in the house? We good? Guesses as to what is the most important room in the house? Water closet. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> water closet. Who calls it a water closet? Give me a break. You're totally right. And you know what? You know how important bathrooms are to me? They are this important. I wrote a whole book about them. Okay. This book is called Building Better Bathrooms. I haven't even told you about my books yet. This is my third book. I wrote it with my friends, uh, Jane and Samantha. Jane is an architect. Samantha is a building code specialist. And we, um, we as a team of accessibility professionals, we're just like, we have so much to share. We're gonna write a brochure about bathrooms. And then like eight months later and 90, no, 167 pages later, we're like, oh, I guess we're writing an entire book about bathrooms. So this is on my website. Um, if you need some help with your bathroom or you have an organization that needs some help with their bathroom, this is my very first book. This is Build Your Space, How to create an accessible home for you, your family, and your future. And this is the gift that you get um, at the end of the workshop tonight. I have an ebook version to send everybody here. And I have my awesome uh, tech marketing guru, Tara, who has set up a page where you guys can download your own version of the book. The reason I wrote it is because, like I had said, we spent um, two and a half years planning and building this house. And I learned a ton. I went to people's houses. I went and stayed with my friend, Chris, cooked in her kitchen, showered in her shower, ladies and gentlemen, and learned so much about what worked for me, what I wanted to do differently in all these different settings that I didn't want to keep it all in my head. Like I had this fabulous house, yes, but I wanted other people to have the opportunity to have a shortcut of not having to do all of that visiting and learning and research. I wanted here, here are some shortcuts for you to learn how to create your own accessible space that works for you, the things to think about, the questions to ask. So, so that's why I wrote this book because I didn't wanna just keep it all in my head. I wanted to share it with everybody. Um, and then my second book is called Roadmap to Recovery, Finding Your Way Forward After Spinal Cord Injury. And that is also available free for download from my website. I wrote it in conjunction with Spinal Cord Injury Ontario. Again, I learned so much going through the recovery from a spinal cord injury, things that um, I thought everybody should know about. <laughs> so I wrote them down. Anyways, so you can find my, um, my books on my website. And like I said, I'm going to have a, a copy of Build Your Space that will um, come to you today. So we're going to go. Um, behind me is the laundry. We're coming into the master end of the house, the master bedroom end of the house. We're gonna roll through my closet because it's not a walk-in closet, it's a roll through closet. 
And um, so you can see here behind me, my husband's stuff is up on the tall end and my stuff is down here on the short end. So we're making space of all available spaces in the closet. And if we go that way, we're in the bedroom, but we're coming through to the bathroom, the most important room in the house. I'm gonna turn you around. So instead of seeing me, you're gonna see the bathroom. Just make sure I've got you guys on a good angle here. So um, I call it my party bathroom, just like my party pantry, because at the time when we were designing, I was using a shower commode. So I had two sets of wheels and I didn't know what my capabilities were going to be. And I didn't know what kind of shower bench I was going to have. So I was still using um, that shower commode. Juggling two sets of wheels in a small space was not working in the old farmhouse. So we were like, okay, go big or go home. So we went big uh, and stayed home. Grab bars. There's, there's been hot debate between me and some of my friends about grab bars um, because I use grab bars for leaning. I get dressed on the toilet. Um, so I have a shower and I get onto the toilet and I dry my undersides and I get dressed because I feel like, <laughs> thanks Bree, I feel like um, there is less friction pulling pants up on the slippery surface of the toilet than there is friction getting dressed in bed. So that what is what works for me. I know everybody does it differently and that's totally cool and totally fair. The reason why I have grab bars on both sides of the toilet is because it saves me energy and improves my balance when doing that. So I'm leaning left, pulling pants up on the right. I'm leaning right, pulling pants up on the left. When I lean on my wheelchair, it doesn't stay where I want it to, even when I have my brakes on. So I learned in this sort of nook in my old house, when I came home from rehab and I learned to get on and off the toilet, this was the space, the setup of that space in the old house. So I designed it to be exactly the same in my new house because it was working for me. The fun thing that my contractor came up with beside the toilet here, we built this, it's called a pony wall or a half wall. And in here, we put in cubbies for like secret storage of supplies. So I have all my catheters and everything right here that I need within reach right beside the toilet. Um, it makes it private. It makes it um, private and super, super accessible. So I've got four cubbies here. Those last two down there are, are just fakes. Got my underwear, got extra toilet paper. Um, I have a garbage can right beside the toilet. And my eye is watering. I'm not crying. You're not making me cry. And the toilet paper roll is below the grab bar. And you're like, why does she have a hair dryer beside the toilet? Who's asking that question? Amanda. <laughs> so one of the things that I love to do is swim. And when I came home from rehab, I was traveling to my local community pool and I had somebody with me. I had a PSW that would come with me to the pool to help me get in and out of the pool, to help me get dressed in the change room. I still was all like a floppy fish, right? Like I didn't have any control of my core and I couldn't get dressed on my own and all of that. And you know, you know how hard it is to put socks on when your feet are wet and you can't tell your feet where to go. I mean, you can tell them where to go, but it doesn't doesn't have any effect, right? So we we came up with drying my feet with a hair dryer so that I could get my socks on, so that we could go back out into the winter and and not freeze, right? So I installed a hair dryer so that I could dry my feet, so that I could put my shoes and socks on with less work. So that means you also have to have an electrical outlet beside your toilet. And that's a future thing too, right? Like if I decide I wanna have a bidet, you need to have power for the water or I don't even know, like some, some bidets need a electrical outlet, some bidets don't, but 
Maybe you have a power chair, a power wheelchair, and you need to plug that in while you're sitting on the toilet. There are so many things that we don't even know because they haven't been invented yet that we might need to plug in while you're sitting on the toilet. So you need to be prepared for that. The other thing about electricity is it's in my ceiling in the bathroom because I might need a lift down the road and you need to have the electricity available for that lift. When we planned the trusses, we also planned for the load bearing capacity to be greater in case of installing a lift. So here and in the bedroom as well. Um, toilet, other toilet things. Having a tall toilet, this is uh, 18 inches to the top of the toilet seat, makes transferring on and off the toilet easier. Having the open front, look at how wobbly my toilet seat is. Ugh, awful. Manufacturers have got to do better at that. Anybody here a toilet manufacturer? No toilet manufacturer? Probably not, I know. It was a long shot. So anyways, having the open front means there's more space for hands to get between legs, right? Um, having a toilet seat lid gives you something to lean against, a backrest. Um, yes, you can lean against the toilet tank, but I find, and you've probably noticed in, in places where if you're leaning against just the tank, you can shift the lid. You ever, yeah, everybody's nodding. You've shifted the lid, right? And you're like, oh, I'm afraid I'm gonna push the lid and it's gonna fall off the toilet and smash on the floor. I've never actually had that happen, but I certainly have feared it happening. All of these little things add up. All of those little fears. Oh, am I gonna smash my friend's toilet tank cover onto the floor? All of those fears, they all add up. They all add stress. Okay, let's talk about showers. Roll in shower means being able to actually roll right into the shower safely, no lip, no threshold, no step. It's called a zero threshold shower, which mine currently is not actually zero threshold. Long story short, tile cracked, we're getting the floor replaced. So there's like a three eighths of an inch lip. Um, and if you look at my YouTube, you'll see a video of what happens when all four wheels are not touching the floor. So anyways, here's the, here's the shower, the, I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna put you up on my wall. Everybody still hear me okay? I took my headphones out. So good, okay. So looking at um, the shower, I have this lovely large bench, load bearing for two people, nudge, nudge, wink, wink. Um, where you can reach the shower controls while seated. So I roll in here. I get my butt out of my chair. Pull the shower curtain. I usually have the shower curtain right here. Pull the shower curtain so that it blocks water from getting onto my chair. And I'm right here reaching all of my shower controls. So everything is within reach. Um, that we have the rain shower for the tall people, which is my husband, and then we have the handheld shower on the uh, on the adjustable um, temperature and you know whichever control. This is a funny thing. You wouldn't think of it as an accessibility feature. You can't really see it. I'm gonna have to bring the camera closer so you can see it, but it's just, a, it's a soap dispenser, right? Shampoo, conditioner, shower gel. So I'm not juggling bottles, right? Everything is one pump and it's into your hand and it's one handed. So if you need to support yourself with your other hand, if you're holding onto a grab bar or you're holding onto your seat, so that you're not wibbly wobbly, you you don't have that extra hand. And when I was first injured, I couldn't do this. 
I couldn't have both my hands out. I had to hold myself up, which, you know, that's just the way it is. So being able to free up your hands um, is a really good thing. The other thing I always have in my shower is my reacher. Um, sometimes I forget to get my towel, so I can actually reach to get my towel with my reacher. I can close the shower curtain with my reacher. I can pick up my razor when I drop my razor on the floor. All of those kinds of things. My chair ever rolled away? I guess I could get it with my reacher. So the grab bars that I have in the shower, one on each wall, they just look like towel bars. And I treat them just like towel bars. Um, but I use them for leverage to get off of my seat and back into my wheelchair. Everybody does this kind of stuff differently, so it's always fun. Okay, there you go. You see how wobbly my chair is? It's because only three wheels are on one level surface. Amanda, it's okay. I'm gonna be okay. <laughs> Amanda's like, I can't look. Yeah, I'm no, just I'm like, oh my watching. goodness, we're gonna have this on recording. Oh, <laughs> you're all watching. It's all good, it's all good. <laughs> you guys are hilarious. I want to just show you closely. Um, this is just an Amazon purchase, that soap dispenser. It's probably the winningest, um, cheapest accessibility feature in my whole house. I think I probably paid 15 bucks for it. So do it, I dare you. <laughs> Shower questions. Um, Julie, someone wants to know what your level of injury is and how long you've been injured. Oh, yes. Um, my level is T4 and I've been injured for six and a half years, 2015. Yeah. Sorry, I should have said that earlier. So how long does it take for like a typical um, like bathroom reno or like a kitchen reno? Like obviously it depends on the amount of stuff that you have to do, but like for your bathroom specifically, now that we see the size of it, about how long did it take to renovate it? Um, well, this was a new build, right? The, the old farmhouse, um, the, when we, we tore out the tub and put in a roll-in shower and we put two grab bars beside the toilet and we took out um, the cabinet and put in a wall hung sink. And that took a weekend. So it depends on the depth of the renovation. If you're like, if you're gutting to the studs and you have to drywall and do all of that, that's obviously going to take more time. And the, yeah, Jacob says he just recently um, got a roll in shower and it has made a world of difference. Absolutely. I totally totally buy that. Um, grab bars are uh, very necessary, but potentially dangerous thing if they're not installed properly. So how many people here have pulled grab bars off walls? Me, at a hotel of all places, true story. Um, that's because the grab bar wasn't installed into the stud and it also, um, there wasn't backing behind the drywall. You can't have load bearing capacity on a grab bar unless it's installed into a stud or into backing, which is three quarter inch plywood between the studs. And that's what happened in that hotel was they had literally just screwed it into the drywall and I pulled it off the wall. Actually, you know what? I've pulled two um, grab bars off walls before. Hmm. Yes. So when you don't know what is behind the wall, you can add wood to the front of the wall. 
Okay. And Healthcraft is a grabber company that I work with all the time. They actually provide you with the backing. Now, this is a different situation. This is a piece of maple that we put on the wall um, after the fact. There's lots of backing back here. Casey was my builder. We have this back the shit out of it mentality. Everywhere in the bathroom, we have backed um, floor to ceiling in the shower. Like I could make like a climbing gym in my shower and put climbing features everywhere because the whole thing is backed. This was added because um, the, anyways, some construction issues meant that the wall was further away than the toilet should have been. So we just brought the grab bar closer by putting that piece of wood between the wall and the grab bar. Does that make sense? Anyways, I just wanted to show you that you can add wood after the fact. If you don't have the backing, you can add the wood in there to um, provide the solid support. Uh, I'm not gonna put those back on yet because I'm gonna show you my sink. So roll under, here's my sink. The mirror is right to the counter height, so I can see as much of myself as possible. There's nothing worse than rolling up to a sink and seeing your forehead, right? Everybody's been there, I am sure, especially in a hotel, right? You go to like put your makeup on and you can see your hairline and you're like, oh yeah, top of my head looks good today. I'm doing good. So <laughs> anyways, you wanna be able to see yourself in the mirror, right? Um, you know those trendy sinks that are like bowls sitting on top of a counter? Ever tried to get your chin over top of one of those? Oh my god, aren't they just the worst, right? And then you end up with toothpaste dripping down your chin. So you want that sink to be as flush to the counter as possible. It's not impossible, um, but if you can get past all of those fancy sinks, just go to a plain old regular sink with lever taps. Um, make sure that the spigot where the water comes out comes far enough into the bowl that you don't have to reach farther and so that water's not splashing all over the back of the counter. So that's on top of the sink. Let's look down below the sink. Okay, so roll under means actually being able to get all the way up and under the sink. Okay, toe clearance. Do you have toe clearance under your sink? Because toe clearance is what allows you to get as close as possible. It's one thing to be able to get your knees under, but if your toes get stopped by the, um, the skirt, because the skirt goes all the way to the floor, then you can't get all the way under there. And I try to future-proof my clients' homes by telling them to finish the baseboard, finish the wall, so that if you do decide to take the cabinets off, that work is done. Often, if you go into your kitchen and open, like if you don't have a roll under kitchen, you go and open the cupboards underneath the kitchen, they haven't even finished the floor. Like they haven't carried the tile all the way to the wall. And so to be able to have a finished looking kitchen um, with knee clearance, you have to go and dig out your paint colors and figure out how to paint that wall to make it look finished. So toe clearance lets you get right in up and close and designing with that in mind um, is what I try and teach people. Do it right the first time, right? It saves you work, saves you work down the road. Um, the drawers I have right beside um, right beside my sink so that everything is within reach. I have open storage for towels. I have closed storage that's really easy to open. You just push on the cabinet and it pops open. These are just I Ikea cabinets. Oops, that's because I'm backwards here. So, you know, the things that you want to be private, your medicines, you don't want to look at them, all that kind of stuff behind these very plain looking but totally functional. Storage, super important to have lots of storage. <sighs> Questions about bathrooms. <laughs> Remembering that I've written a whole book just about bathrooms and I could talk to you about bathrooms ad nauseum. <laughs> J 
Jackie literally speechless. <laughs> I'm and Julie, show you. it's Michelle Mahoney here. Hi, Michelle. How are you? Great. Um, I have a, can I tell you a quick bathroom story from the building Absolutely. that I work at? I work at Dalhousie University at the law school. And I go into every day that I go to the bathroom for the first time, I go in and I look at, um, there's five stalls and the accessible stall is the most stupidest stall, if, if that's a word I can use, um, because yep. the uh, toilet paper roll holder is way above the grab bar and it's like, I can't even reach it. And, um, but the rest of the, so the other four, um, the other four stalls, I go in and um, whichever one has the least amount of toilet paper in the, in the stall, because it's not an open roll concept. So, um, right. which, so I go into each stall and whichever one has the least amount of toilet paper will be my toilet for the day because I'll be able to access the toilet paper. <laughs> right, yep. And I tell Rip people it. that story. Um, I tell people that story and they're like, oh my God, I went to the bathroom today and I thought of you and I'm like, good, education done. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Everybody that I talk to about bathrooms or accessible parking or whatever, they always come back to me and say, oh, Julie, you know, I was at this place and I thought of you because I thought, how is Julie gonna, you know, fill in the blank, park, pee, get food from the restaurant, whatever, right? Thanks, Michelle. You know, my daughter's going to Dalhousie next year and I'm gonna just come and tell Dalhousie I'm gonna do an entire audit of the entire university and we're gonna fix it all. Who's fix going to all. Dalhousie? My daughter. Oh, okay, oh, that's right, that's right. Yes, we're gonna have to have to get together and have a have a hookup and, and uh, meet and, and uh, find out where she's gonna live and, uh, oh yeah, I remember your yes. story about your hotel. Yes. <laughs> Somebody was asking about grab bars. So um, Old Code in Ontario had grab bars attached to walls on an angle. So like a 45 degree angle. And um, the base of that angle usually starts at the front of the toilet. So pretend you're sitting on the toilet, right? And as far as the front of the toilet, you're now got a grab bar on the wall like this. So you can maybe get your hand on the bottom of that angle, which is essentially useless because you'd have to be almost sending to reach up to that grab bar. So new code, new as of 2012, 2015, um, has Ontario building code putting L bars on the wall beside the toilet. So it's a horizontal component and a vertical component. The, whoops, vertical and horizontal. Sorry, I got my directions mixed up there. So the horizontal component allows for the leaning and the leverage to get off the toilet and back into a wheelchair. And the vertical component allows somebody who's seated and trying to get up into standing to pull themselves up. The angle doesn't work for either of those things. Asterix, okay? There's a little asterisk on that because the angle does work for some people. I have met some people and they're like, I like the angle grab bar. And I'm like, well, okay, but I think it sucks. So anyways, the new building code has vertical component and horizontal component. And that works for a greater variety of people. Okay, so that's that's the lowdown on the the diagonal. The diagonal is pretty pretty useless. Um, Dawn says, before I had to quit working, I had a job that um, because I was starting, they installed an automatic door. People came up and thanked me uh, because sometimes they had to take boxes home. Absolutely, right? That's like a universal design thing, it works for everybody. Everybody can walk up a ramp. Everybody can roll up a ramp. Everybody can push a, a stroller up a ramp or a delivery trolley up a ramp, but not everybody can do that up a set of stairs. So there's like the basics of universal design 
it works for everybody. Something else that I wanted to share from a safety perspective. When we um, were living in the old farmhouse, I'm gonna roll up to my window so I can show you the view of where the farmhouse used to be. Uh, so at the end of the patio down there in that break of the trees, that's where the farmhouse was. So we lived there while we built here. And while we were living there, there was only one way for me to get out of that house. And that was down the ramp. And so what that meant was if there was an emergency, a fire, and that ramp exit was blocked, that main door was blocked, I was trapped in my house. And I would have had to throw myself out of my chair and bum down the cement steps to get out the other door. So a big priority for me building this house was safety and having that alternate exit. How am I gonna get out of my house in an emergency? And so we put a second secondary exit out the bedroom door. So that's where I am right now. I'm in my bedroom. I can roll out of bed and roll out onto the patio. Um, if you don't have a secondary exit, make your emergency plan. Do a middle of the night fire drill trial run with your family, with your people, with your emergency contact, so that you know how you're going to get out of your space in an emergency. I cannot stress the importance of that. And two weeks ago, um, we heard a story from a friend who was in that situation where she had a fire in her house and she didn't get out when she should have, um, but she still got out. So it happens. I would love to take you out and show you my patio and my gardens. There's not a whole lot going on out there right now, plus it's zero. <laughs> so I'm just gonna stay inside with you here instead. Um, know that I have raised beds to facilitate gardening. So I'm not leaning down or having to get down onto the ground to weed and garden. Um, they are all at the same height as my wheelchair so I could actually get out of my chair onto the edge. It's about an eight inch wide um, piece of wood on the top um, so that I could lean into the gardens and, and do gardening that way. But I can also stay in my chair um, at the same time. I'm looking into my closet. Uh, yes. I'm looking into my closet and I'm remembering about the, the fact that I haven't talked to you about drawers. Doors versus drawers. Okay, so be it in your closet, be it in your bathroom, be it in your kitchen. If you have doors, take them off and just use the shelf or take the shelf out, install sliders and voila, you've got drawers. Because when you have a drawer, you're pulling everything to you instead of having to dive in to the cupboards and find what you're looking for. So it's another energy saving mechanism. Um, how are we doing? Oh, we're at 701. We've gone over time. That was okay. You were doing so good. And we were just I, having the time following you around the house. I could literally just keep talking and talking. I want to know what your questions are. Um, Vanessa says, the one ramp thing is an issue um, at our all together playground. There is a ramp on one side. So if my daughter goes up the ramp with me, but then down the other side, I have to book it down the ramp yeah, and around to catch up with her. Absolutely, one ramps, one ramp, one exit, for sure always going to be an issue. I'm so excited about how many, how many people are here tonight. This is amazing. Oh, yeah, I gotta tell you how to download your copy of Build Your Space. So um, can I share my screen? Yes, I can. This is what you need to do. You need to go to, um, to my website, juliesawchuk.info slash BYS free book. I'm gonna drop this in the chat um, so that you can just click on it. Okay, so this is what you're gonna go to. You can um, put your name and your email address and then download and you'll get your ebook. I'm pointing at the screen. I don't know, can you see me pointing at the screen? 
Oh, so funny, Julie. You think after so many years, I tried to click on your link on the screen. <laughs> it doesn't work. <laughs> As it's there, it's dropped in the chat. Julie thoughtchuck.info slash BYS free book. And you can download your copy of Build Your Space. Um, you'll also get access to my newsletter. I send out messages randomly when stories and things inspire me to share them with my audience. Hints, tips, crazy shit that happens related to accessibility. Um, I know some of you already received my newsletter. I, I hope you enjoy reading it as much as I enjoy writing it because writing is my second favorite thing uh, because obviously talking to you guys is my first favorite thing. Hi, Jesse. Hello, everyone. Hi, Julie. Hello. So any more questions, any things you, any burning issues that you have, um, send me an email, Julie Sachuk, Julie at juliesachuk.ca. Just make sure you spell my last name right. S-A-W-C-H-U-K. Everybody spells it wrong. Even students, when I was teaching in high school, I'd had it written on my nameplate on my door of my classroom and they would still spell it wrong. So I get it, it's a thing. <laughs> I also have, um, I, so I have those other two books, the um, Roadmap to Recovery, which is free to download from my website, juliesachuk.ca and um, but the bathroom, Building Better Bathrooms, everything you need to know about bathrooms, change rooms, um, showers, tubs, you name it, multi-stalls, universal washrooms, from signage to color contrast, grab bars, shower benches, everything. Everything you ever need to know about bathrooms. Today I recorded a video about toilet flushing. Mm. <laughs> I love it. I love it so much. You have to Julie, wait for that one. Thank you so much. I'm sorry that I'm in late, but thank you so much for your time today and just providing your resources and all of this value to this incredible group of people. Um, you guys, thank you, all of you, for taking an hour out of your night to join us and to listen to Julie. Um, be sure to check out her website. It will be sent to you in a follow-up email as all of the recordings are sent. Um, and Bree, do you want to close us off? Yes, I can. Um, so thank you all again for coming. We're going to take a quick little picture for the gram as always. So if everyone wants to turn their camera on, if they're willing and say cheese. Awesome. All right. And before everyone goes, we have to announce the winner of the tires. So the winner for the